Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast and get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome Matthew Allen. He's a medical student in today's Kevin MD articles titled, Are We Missing the Mark with Generative AI? Matthew, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. So let's start by briefly sharing your story and journey to where you are today. So in undergrad, I interned at a health tech startup company that was doing e-consult implementation. And I was young and naive, but we'd go out to medical clinics and train doctors on how to use the system that connected the primary care docs with the specialists, because this health system was having an issue with, you know, there's not enough specialists. A lot of specialty visits are not necessary. The primary doc can handle the patient's condition. And so if we can connect them virtually, we could solve that problem. And that kind of opened my eyes to, wow, doctors really are unhappy with their computers. You know, instead of seeing them as a help, they see them as a hindrance, something between them and patients. And I was really confused by this. I was thinking, man, this should make medicine a lot easier. So I kind of got introduced to that whole world. And when I was applying to medical school, I was lucky enough to get accepted to UC San Diego. And they are, you know, a national leader in informatics and how com clinicians are using computers. And so I was just so excited to take the opportunity to come to UC San Diego and get more involved in that world. Perfect. And let's jump into one of the hottest topics, generative AI, things like ChatGBT and Google Bard. And right now we have so many healthcare startups kind of tripping over themselves to see how generative AI can apply to physicians today. I'm interested in hearing your insight. Your Kevin MD article is titled, Are We Missing the Mark with Generative AI? So tell us about this article. Right. Yeah. So, you know, the reason I wrote the article is because Early on, a lot of the excitement was, hey, you know, if I type in a question to this ChatGPT, it'll totally produce an answer. We could use that to answer patient messages. You know, doctors' inboxes are overflowing. Let's use it to solve that problem. Doctors don't like taking time to write these really long notes. You know, let's use it to solve that problem. And those are all worthwhile use cases. I want to emphasize that. But I was also reading a lot of articles that said, hey, the chart keeps getting longer and longer. You know, the average medical chart now is actually half the length of Shakespeare's Hamlet. And a lot of the information in the chart is duplicate. You know, like copy and paste is our friend, but it's also our enemy. And so really we have an overabundance of low quality information in the medical chart. We're not, we're not wanting, you know, some machine to just produce a bunch more. So I, I worried, are we just going to use this to automate a bunch of stuff and make notes even longer and make the charts even more bloated? And then clinicians down the road are going to have to just sort through all this information. So, so that kind of got, got me thinking about the article. All right. So you mentioned that there's a task force, the AMIA 25 by 5 task force regaining the current state of clinical documentation burden. Tell us about the key findings from this report and use that as a jumping off point in terms of how generative AI can or, or cannot help us. Totally. The American Medical Informatics Association saw that documentation burden was a huge issue. And they started this task force to try to reduce it by 25% within five years, which is ambitious. So one of the first things they did was they looked at all the current efforts being done by organizations to reduce documentation burden. And what was interesting is that all of those efforts focused on document creation, you know, kind of what I was talking about before, automating notes or responding to messages, et cetera. Not, nothing focused on information retrieval, you know, chart review, you know, a new patient's coming into my office. How am I going to familiarize myself with them? Or, or, you know, maybe I'm in an acute care setting, the emergency room. Uh, I don't know this patient. I've got three to five minutes to, you know, scroll through old notes, try to find what's important about this patient and be ready for them. And so, Information retrieval is a huge, huge part of documentation burden, but sometimes we don't think of it as that. We just think about, you know, writing notes. And so Amy had definitely highlighted that there was a gap there. So in terms of document creation, we're only 
about one year into generative AI, ChatGPT was released a year ago. Mm -hmm. Do you feel mm -hmm. that document creation is kind of an iterative step and perhaps a next step then would be information retrieval? So I would think that document creation, the reason that it's being focused on is because it's relatively low hanging fruit. I agree. I, I do agree. And it's not that there's nobody working on this and we should go after the low hanging fruit initially. But I think people need to understand the documentation burden is about more than just creating the documentation. And if we just focus on that, we might make our other problem harder. You know, we might make there be more stuff that we have to summarize and, and sort through. And so I, I think it should be more of a focus even from the start. So you mentioned that you're at UCSD, which has a pretty Correct. strong clinical informatics program. What's the general mm -hmm. consensus there among the thought leaders in healthcare IT regarding the intersection between generative AI and, and healthcare? Yeah, I'd say, I mean, almost everyone here is, is very bullish on generative AI. They think that is going to be incredibly impactful in a lot of ways that, you know, we probably don't even think about right now. I would say as far as specific use cases, some people are split. You know, some people think answering patient messages is going to be totally revolutionary and help doctors a lot. Others are very skeptical. You know, with summarization, some people think, you know, the use case is obvious and it's going to work. Other people think, yeah, there's no way, you know, large language models, once you, the document gets too long that it has to summarize, it's not very good at it. So honestly, there's a split about some of the use cases. So you have a background. You said that you interned at a healthcare startup and you've kind of seen the evolution of generative AI. So taking that next step, the intersection between generative AI information retrieval, what do you see as an ideal scenario? Give some, some hypothetical case studies where you see that usefulness in generative AI in terms of information retrieval. Yeah. I mean, I think what would be awesome is something like a Wikipedia page for a patient, you know, instead of going into a patient's chart and having tons of old notes and tons of old labs, you know, we could still look at that stuff if we want to, but you have a Wikipedia page with different headings that everybody agrees are important. Are important. You could expand them, you could collapse them. And in three minutes, you can have a really good idea of who is this patient and what's important about them and what's important to your specific specialty or context. I think one thing I'd also mention is we need to be rigorous about evaluating these tools. You know, in digital health and generative AI, there's a lot of excitement, which I think is good, but we need to make sure that we don't get caught up in that excitement and start implementing a bunch of stuff without rigorous evidence that it helps patient outcomes, you know, patient outcomes should be at the center of everything we do. And what's nice about digital tools is in a lot of ways, it's easy to study them. You can turn on the tool for half the doctors and not for the other half or, or half the patients and not for the other half. And you should be able to rigorously um, evaluate their real world, real world performance in real time fairly easily. So I think we can't get so excited that we miss that evaluation piece because then we're going to lose doctors trust even more <laughs> that that technology is going to help them and that would be uh, the worst case scenario what about the impact on physician and clinician burnout a lot of these tools i see are marketed to making documentation easier and documentation as you know is one of the pain points that a lot of physicians complain about should patient yeah. outcomes be the only metric? What if it improves clinician burnout and, and helps them stay practicing a little bit longer? How important yeah, is that? You, you make an excellent point. And it is very important. And, you know, patient outcomes and physician burnout are tied together. You know, if your physician is burned out, they're not going to do as good of a job. So I absolutely agree with you that physician burnout should be part of the conversation. I do think that sometimes when we're talking about all this stuff, you know, all the articles will be about technology and physician burnout, you know? So I think maybe there's just a disproportionate focus on that. And so we also have to think about patient outcomes. Maybe that's because I'm young and naive and I'm not quite burned out. Uh, 
but but I think you know that's what most of the literature is on is about physician burnout and how technology is going to help that so I think maybe broaden our perspective a little bit so what do you see in the coming months? I think it's evolving so quickly. And as I mentioned before, we're about one year into the introduction of ChatGPT and it's created some seismic shifts in terms of what we can expect in terms of that generative AI healthcare intersection. What do you see the next few months to bring just from what you're seeing in, in your environment at UCSD? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think the tools are going to get better very quickly you know there are barriers to doing what we're talking about you know one would be cost using things like chapter gpt every time you make a query there's a cost to that you know there's also limits to how much information can you feed the tool to summarize all of those things over the next six months will go down you know the cost will go down the chat GPT will able, be able to accept larger amounts of information to summarize, you know, all those metrics are going to improve. And so some of the hurdles we've currently been facing with some of these use cases will become not as important with the advance of the technology. So I think we'll start to see more use cases than, you know, just patient messaging and automated note-taking. And I hope that comes with large academic medical centers running, you know, randomized clinical trials on different applications of generative AI in the next six months. Talk about some of the downsides and pitfalls that we need to look out for as generative AI becomes more pervasive in our healthcare system. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, some are technical, you know, it, it you could have new attack vectors for cybersecurity and HIPAA concerns. You know, you could have de-skilling of physicians if we rely on the computer even more, you know, when we don't have access to it, are we gonna be able to be physicians? I, I do think those will take a little bit longer. I think whenever you're using technology to solve problems in healthcare, it can make it more human or, or less human. So we want to use technology that fades into the background and allows us to connect with patients and have that personal relationship. I think what we need to look out for is making sure that it doesn't take more and more human connection out of medicine and, and make it more impersonal and more, I'm chatting with a bot instead of talking to the, to the person, if that makes sense. So I want to shift the conversation, and this isn't actually part of your article, but just from your personal experience, you're in your second year of medical school. How has generative AI affected medical education from your perspective? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, people do use it for sure to, to study and to answer questions, and I think it it's helpful. You know, in some ways, medical students already for a long time have been using the internet and third party resources to study and learn medicine. So I don't think that it's like a fundamental shift, but it can make you a lot more um, efficient. Like I was actually talking to my wife the other day who's in law school and she's like, oh, you wrote that article. You didn't even know I've been using that a ton in law school when I have to do like a lot of procedural history reading. I plug in the huge mass of text into ChatGPT and have it summarize it for me. And it just helps me so much. She gave the caveat that she has to teach the bot what is legally pertinent information to pull out of, you know, the lot of text. But I, I think same goes for medical students. If we have to digest a ton of information, this could help us do it more efficiently. Now, is it pretty commonplace among you and your fellow classmates? For sure. Yeah. Commonplace. I mean, initially everybody was like, oh, what is this tool? And some people were more hesitant to try it, but but now everybody's familiar with it. And I don't think everybody uses it all the time, but a lot of people do, and everybody's very aware of it and its implications. How about the medical school professors? Have there been any guidelines in terms of how to use and how not to use generative AI in medical education? Yeah, good question. Yes, professors bring it up. I would not say that there's a consensus. Some of them are more, yes, use it for everything. Others are more, hey, you know, on this task, don't use generative AI because I worry that it will take away from your learning experience. So it's kind of professor dependent and situation dependent. 
any concerns the professors bring up regarding patient care, like patient privacy? Has that been formally brought up among your medical education, among your classes? That specific topic, no. I mean, institutionally, definitely UCSD is going to be saying, you know, do not put any private patient information into open source AI box. You know, that is definitely a security risk, but specifically at the medical school, no. We're talking to Matthew Allen. He's a medical student. Today's Kevin MD article is titled, Are We Missing the Mark with Generative AI? Matthew, let's end with some of your take home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. Awesome. Yeah, so for my first takeaway, I'd say to clinicians, we need clinicians to be involved in this. You know, if you're talking about something like automated notes or chart summarization, we need what physicians want to be prioritized so that they can do a good job of taking care of their patients. And that means they need to be involved in the process. If, you know, medical, legal, or regulatory, or administrative, or quality people are the ones that decide how these tools are going to be used, it might not look how your average clinician wants it to end up looking. So, you know, for clinicians, get involved in in these tools that are being developed at your organization. And then my other takeaway would be for my fellow med students. I'm sharing this in part to keep myself uh, accountable, but I read recently uh, a big report that a lot of people are talking about that, you know, the majority of US medical students are planning on either leaving me- medicine or not treating patients. You know, there's this, you know, everybody's talking about burnout and medicine's hard. And so a lot of medical students are like, man, maybe I'm just going to be a researcher I'm, or I'm just going to work for a startup or I'm going to be a thought leader or whatever. And those are good things, but we need people to take care of patients. So I'd encourage all of my classmates, even if you're not going to do full-time patient care, uh, I, I don't think we should ever give up on that as part of what we do. And we should trust that these tools and technologies are going to solve a lot of the issues that are taking the joy out of medicine. And so hopefully our careers will be less burnout ridden and we can, you know, enjoy patient care. Matthew, thank you so much for sharing your perspective and insight. And thanks for coming on the show. No, Rob, thanks for having me.